on my upset is finished in 70% less time and you do 30% loss, less total volume. Because everyone just wants to be told what to do. And I think that's intellectually lazy. For a short guy and a deadlift for a tall basketball player, it's, it's going to take that joint through vastly different range, ranges of motion. It's going to be a longer bar path. You're, you're going to be performing way more work. All right. So I want to kick things off talking about myo reps. You invented myo reps during the days when you went as Blade on the HST and bodybuilding.com forums. You've said it's just a tool and you're not the myo rep guy. Myo reps even have gained popularity and people like Arnold himself have mentioned it in his newsletter. My understanding is you view myo reps as a rest pause method where you do an activation set where you get close to failure to get high fiber recruitment and then short sets with short rests of three to five reps. Can you talk through myo reps in as much detail as possible and advise what is the practical application for intermediate lifters? Um, yeah, I mean, it's basically just a way to get uh, uh, muscle growth stimulus in a shorter amount of time. And there is a study that's, you know, it's been in publishing now for probably close to two years. Uh, from University of Tampa that compared a Meyer upset to, I think it was four traditional sets with long rests in between. And the muscle growth was the same. There was actually a slight trend towards Meyer ups having better muscle growth, but, you know, not stati uh, statistically significant. Uh, probably individual as well. Um, but a Meyer upset is finished in 70% less time and you do 30% loss, less total volume since you're basically compressing all those sets into one extended set. So you kind of, um, you have to spend the first few reps of a set to get to a fiber recruitment level, like where you activate all the muscle fibers in a muscle so that the mechanical tension, like uh, the actual load on the bar can stretch and signal uh, the muscle to grow bigger. And um, since you're extending just a single set, then you don't, you know, you're saving yourself from having to do all of those reps to get to that recruitment level, that sweet spot, so to speak. Now, where that level, that sweet spot is, can, you know, differ on an individual level. Um, you know, beginners probably get more stimulation from the very beginning of each set, whereas someone more advanced probably need to do a few more sets and get closer to failure, um, especially when we're talking light, moderate to light loads. So uh, a load you can do 8 to 20 reps with is, um, you know, mostly uh, seen as equal in terms of muscle growth, but... Uh, the lighter loads you're doing, the closer to failure you have to be to actually get the muscle to understand that it's supposed to be growing bigger. Uh, if not, you're basically just doing a ton of warm-up sets and, you know, most of us know that intuitively and logically that doesn't really build a lot of muscle mass unless you do a metric ton of them. Uh, obviously, 50 sets of warm-ups uh, could probably stimulate some muscle growth, but, you know, why not do a few sets. And um, understanding that mechanism, which is called the Henneman size principle, just basic muscle physiology that tells you that you need to have some level of fatigue or lift a very heavy load to activate all of the fibers in the muscle so that all of them can contribute to lift the load. So it's either fatigue or load that provides this ability to stimulate all of the muscle fibers and, and make them grow. Uh, so it's like a graded response. Uh, and based on that, I created my reps to get to that level and stay there by just having a short, sufficiently short rest period so that fatigue doesn't dissipate too much. But I emphasize controlling and managing fatigue because we know excessive fatigue will limit your ability to recruit muscle fibers. It basically 
drops the recruitment levels because you're so fatigued. There's, you know, physiology, uh, physiological mechanisms that will prevent you from overdoing things. And um, staying in that sweet spot between the lower threshold where you kind of lose activation because you're staying so far from failure that you're not actually getting to the highest recruitment level and not going so close to failure that you are limiting how many total reps you can do and uh, limiting the muscle recruitment due to fatigue. So extending that set, let's say that you pick a load that you could do 12 reps to absolute failure with. So you do 10 reps on the first set. Now you put the load down and rest and just take like three to five deep breaths. That's also kind of the sweet spot before you begin to slowly lose uh, fatigue so that you, you can't activate and recruit sufficiently. Pick the load back up and do between two to five reps, depending on how fatigued you are and the muscle and, you know, individual differences. You will kind of just have to feel your way there, but if you know what the final rep of a set looks like when you go to absolute failure, then you stop before you reach that rep, essentially. So it's both an art and a science. And then you just keep going for as long as it takes. Um, I suggest that you don't do more than five mini rep, uh, uh, so five mini sets in a my rep set, because then you're kind of getting into a more endurance uh, spectrum. And we want to keep this pure and strength and muscle growth oriented. Uh, but if you notice that your performance drops off significantly, you can also end the set there. So let's say that you get 10 on the activation set, a short rest, then you get four reps, short rest, four reps, short rest. And then when you get to the third rep, you're getting very close to failure. So you just stop the set there, even though you didn't get five mini sets. So that's the auto regulation part of things where it's just adapted to your individual fatigability and recoverability. Uh, so um, in my experience, it just adding that extra layer of um, regulating the total volume according to your individual fatigue level uh, just enhanced results dramatically because you don't fatigue yourself so much that it takes a long time to recover before you can train that muscle again. And you just get kind of this weak spot in stimulus. And most of the time, a single Meyer upset is sufficient. You get just the right amount of fatigue, just the right amount of time under tension and high levels of muscle recruitment. And, um, you know, go to the next muscle group or another sufficiently different exercise for that muscle group if you want to do more, of course. Uh, so yeah, that's that's the gist of it. So I know you're talking about uh, you know fatigue. So for example, you know if I could do twelve for lateral raises, you're saying to do ten for that first activation set. Why not do twelve? Why not push that first set uh, as close to failure as possible? Well, like I just said, you limit your muscle recruitment and the number of reps you can do. So if you did twelve, absolute failure a short yeah. rest, you might get one or two reps. Okay. And if that is, that's also the failure, then you're probably not going to get a third set. So if you stop at 10, you could get 10 plus 4, 4, 4, 4, 3. Okay. If you go to absolute failure, you get 12, 2, 0. So it's just, you know, so you not, want not to a very productive. You want to accumulate more, like, effective reps? Yes, uh, exactly. And that's also... Uh, one of the core principles and, and uh, a terminology that I came up with back in 2005, 2006, and has later been, I would say, interpreted and misinterpreted. And Chris Beardsley created his stimulating reps model, which is very similar, um, but more perhaps of a hard and fast rule of only 
the, the final five reps per set are stimulating muscle growth. He later refined it and said, yeah, you know, it can vary. It can be four, it can be five, it can be six, it can be three. It just depends on where you are in the loading range. Uh, but, but many people have kind of, you know, misrepresented uh, it and said that I said that only the five final reps of a set count. And I never said that. I said it's probably within a range and it likely varies between muscle groups and individuals. Okay, so that makes sense. So so you said the the research from the University of Tampa, what did it compare exactly? Did it compare like four straight sets with one activation set and then three mini sets or or what was the the comparison just so um you know the audience can understand like uh the if the time saving is is worth doing for specific exercises for them um well to be honest i don't know precisely i just know looking at the tables they sent me that uh, the overall volume was 30% less. So I do believe they tried with the mini sets to get close to the same effective reps as the traditional sets. So if we're assuming that with four traditional sets, you're getting between 15 and 20 effective reps at that loading range. Now effective reps being a rough estimate of the final most taking recruiting reps of a set and they try to you know equalize that with the my rep set so uh, they actually went to failure on each mini set which isn't part of the method but you know to standardize things i believe that's what they had to do um so i think you know on average they did probably four to six mini sets uh, in addition to the activation set, and um, and yeah, so you complete a Mario set in about two minutes, and you need eight to ten minutes to complete four traditional sets, including the rest periods in between. Yeah, I use it uh, quite often. I use it for kind of uh, lateral raises, some tricep work, some bicep work. I just find it. I need to get back to my work, so I for me that trade-off of saving time is, is worth it um, as opposed to you know like if it's 100 percent optimal or not that's less of a, a priority so what's the right way or what's the easiest way to measure progression when you're doing my rep should it be trying to just increase that activation set by by one um from a rep standpoint like I, I find that to be a little bit challenging of like how to really measure progression compared to straight sets. I tend to only look at the activation sets and the loads. So if you can do a heavier load for the same number of reps on the activation set, or you can do one or two more reps on the activation set with the same load, then by definition you have progressed. So I don't really look at... Um, the mini sets, because those are just to kind of get uh, sufficient volume. And like I said, I prefer auto regulating those. So it can be a lot of mini sets on one workout, and it can be very few on the next one. But it's still progress if you own the activation set, were able to lift a heavy load for the same reps, or you did one or two more reps with the same load. Okay. And uh, what's your Mount Rushmore, your four favorite exercises to do myo reps with and why? Yeah, I like lateral races. Um, I like pectic flies. I generally prefer isolation exercises uh, just because it's more efficient. Uh, I'm not a big fan of doing it on compound lifts simply because um, you're spreading the stimulus on several muscle groups at the same time and it's kind of hard to well, often hard to determine what muscle group got the best stimulus. Um, it's usually the weakest muscle group that gives out first in a given exercise that receives the most stimulus, which is why, for instance, squats can be a great quad builder for some and a great glute builder for others and a great lower back exercise for you know a third group. 
And the same thing with bench press. Um, for me, the bench press always gave me a, an amazing tricep pump, but I never got anything out of it for my uh, pectoral development. So I kind of needed to start doing some isolation exercises and even unilateral exercises, single joint stuff that allows you to focus specifically on that muscle. And that's where I think my reps really shine. Um, so, so yeah, I, I mean, you could take your pick, leg extensions, lateral raises, pectic flies, um, bicep curl, tricep extensions, those, those types of exercises. Awesome. And do you have any thoughts on kind of myo rep match, which is something I think Mike Israel talks about where you do the activation set and then you take a longer rest than you're suggesting. And then I understand that, uh, for each mini set, you're trying to do as many mini sets within it to get to the number of the activation set. So if you did, uh, 15 on the first set, then you would take a break and then you would do, uh, Seven four four. Then you take another break and you would do six three three three. Do you view that as uh, something effective or something just totally different than my reps? Just using uh, similar terminology uh, from a naming convention. Yeah, it's not really my reps anymore. I mean, I have I have two rules, and that's the auto regulation part and you know managing fatigue. Uh, by avoiding failure. Um, I mean, it's it's fine, and I understand why Mike Isretel is recommending that. He's kind of the high volume or maximum recoverable volume guy and, you know, moving between the minimum and the maximum effective volume and cycling that over time. And now I'm also a fan of figuring out your lowest threshold of volume that stimulates muscle growth and if you're curious and if you have enough time, then I suggest that you gradually and progressively like every three to four weeks, because that's kind of the time it takes to uh, even out the, vari uh, the variability between workouts and then add another set and another set and, and see where your upper threshold is for that given frequency. And um, strategically over time, you can figure mm -hmm. out on a f like a full body or three times per week frequency for a muscle group what's the lowest and upper bound and then you reduce the frequency and go to like once every five days perhaps or you know a regular upper lower split and see you'll probably elevate the lowest threshold and the highest threshold and and generally just see where that takes you and I've figured out that for some muscle groups, there's like a sweet spot for frequency and volume that works better. So, for instance, my pectorals don't tolerate a lot of volume in a single workout. And they also need more rest, like a lower frequency, whereas my quads can take a lot of beating and just high volume and frequency. And all of the other muscle groups are somewhere in between. Uh, those um, uh, extreme end, end points. And uh, I, I think being curious about your own training process and actually going through this systematically instead of trying to find the answer online or by, you know, copying someone's workout online is a way more productive way to spend your training career. I completely agree. So for me, a good example there is actually with uh, biceps. If I do too much volume in one session, I find I get like bicep tendonitis and it just doesn't feel great. But if I spread it across a few sessions, um, I don't have that issue. While with back, for example, I can do quite a bit of volume and frequency and seem to be okay with it. So I've just kind of adjusted my uh, training where you know, certain uh, muscle groups have significantly more volume in sets than others just because of how I recover and uh, like tendon issues and things that I'm, I don't want to have to deal with it if I don't have to. Mm. Yeah, that's exactly it. That's what I do with my clients as well. Because everyone just wants to be told what to do. And I think that's intellectually lazy. So you have to strategically figure this out or hire someone that can do that for you or, you know, Use an app or 
AI apps now that are able to kind of look at trends and uh, determine this for you, but or make educated guesses. There's also likely going to be a range. So it's not like this one perfect combination that's going to be universally true uh, across time because your body changes over time, your recoverability, you know, all of these things are affected by your sleep and stress levels and nutrition. So whatever constraints you have also needs to be solved. Some are just staring with a tunnel vision on their training and trying to perfect every minor detail of it. And then, you know, they're drinking coffee until 10 o'clock in the evening and, and sleeping very poorly for four hours and, you know, being proud of that. And that's sabotaging their gains. So it's it's hey. not the frequency. I think you you said this, like, stop majoring in the minors, stop micromanaging. It'll just make you unhappy and miss out on what life has to offer. And yeah. I think that is very accurate. Like, even on a lot of the, the YouTube train channels, a lot of ones that, that I watch, it's 100% focused on uh, being optimal from a training perspective. And that's like, that's one piece of the puzzle in your training life and it's an even smaller piece of the puzzle in your overall life so yeah. it's it's great to have passions and hobbies and to really push yourself but uh, also be careful if you're creating stress and anxiety over things you don't need to because that's actually going to be counterproductive yeah yeah that's what i tend to say that sometimes worrying about these things is more damaging to your training than whatever you gain from micromanaging it yeah, like a, an example for me is I do not use any sort of sleep tracker. I know a lot of people that use sleep trackers and I just generally sleep well. So I'm like, why add that extra overhead, that extra data point and potential stress and anxiety around it when it's not a problem for me just for the sake of having the data? Like, I don't want that data. Yeah, I think that's so well said. I mean, I have clients that are so obsessed with their body weight that any minor fluctuation tend to, you know, cost them really psychological stress. And I think, you know, it's just another metric. It's just information. So use it for um, piecing together uh, along with all of the other metrics, whether your progress is good, but uh, the body requires time to change i mean how much muscle can you build in a year and how much body fat can you lose so people are so obsessed with the instant gratification of achieving results that they get completely ocd about uh, micromanaging stuff on a day-to-day -day basis and even from minute to minute so it's um it's, it's not a good development yeah i think about it like in terms of like things like video games, like if your goal is to just power level yourself up as quickly to a high level, then you're going to kind of get bored because you've mm -hmm. gone so far and now it's moving really slowly when you could just go at a more gradual pace and kind of enjoy the gains and process over the course of a long period. But um, mm -hmm. I think there's, I think there's just also different personality types and some people uh, they want it now. Yeah, um, you know, it's it's a matter of control. You know, you want to control the outcome. You want to have guarantees because, uh, you know, anxiety about the future is just trying to predict something that's inherently volatile and unpredictable and, and chaotic. And uh, even experts are terrible at predicting the future. They're, you know, no better than random guessing. So it's um, it's just this human... I mean, we're gifted with the ability to reflect on our past and predict the future or think about the future. And uh, some people are spending more time in the past or the future than they're in the present. And like you said, being more present and process journey, journey oriented rather than goal oriented and um, obsessing about, you know, instant gratification and avoiding anything that's uncomfortable or painful. It's not a good way to live your life. You need the right balance of hedonism and being able to zoom out and look at your overarching vision and mission and purpose of life. That's, that's what a good life is to me.
For sure. And uh, this, this is kind of on point, but you talked about the curse of the optimizer and there's two common signs. The inability to simply be present and go with the flow and the compulsion to critique every object and experiencing experience, imagining how it could be better. So what advice do you have for those who are motivated? They're watching YouTube fitness, they're goal oriented, and they want to improve their results, but they keep falling into this curse of the optimizer trap. I would say 80% perfection done 100% of the time consistently will always be better than 100% done for short periods of time where you just keep falling off or you know sabotaging everything because it's it's just you know impossible to hit perfect all the time and you know perfect is just a label it's just an interpretation and perception anyway so begin to challenge your uh, beliefs around what perfection actually means because uh, perfectionists are all also the optimizers and i'm speaking as someone who's been doing that for way too many years and you know i transformed it into an ability to piece together a lot of information and help people achieve better results. But it's also a matter of simplifying things, you know, eliminate distractions and the non-essentials. And that does take introspection and reflection and the ability to be just present in the process and try to detach yourself from the outcomes and the results which is incredibly hard sometimes but since you can't predict everything anyway and you can follow the perfect plan and life meets optimal all the time so learning to roll with the punches and build some resilience is uh, way more gratifying in the long term than obsessing about perfection and never missing uh, the mark completely. Yeah, I also feel that what is optimal? If your mm -hmm. if your lens of optimal is what will give me the most muscle mass in X period, then that's going to be very different than if you have that introspection. So for example, optimal for me is like, I want to be in the top uh, 2% in terms of leanness and muscle in my age group for people that have kids that work a, a full-time job. I have all these additional things, which now narrows my scope. So I'm not competing with people who are professional bodybuilders who are younger than me, who can dedicate all their time to this. I've kind of created like a more narrow area that if I can excel in that area from a goal perspective, I'm happy. Um, mm. Because I know I don't want to give up the other parts of my life, which to me is my optimal life experience. Like I want to be able to go have an ice cream with my kids or to go to a birthday party and not think about having a drink and it being about like, for me, those things are important as well. Um, mm -hmm. Enjoying life traveling. So I don't have this crazy expectation of, am I putting on the most muscle in the next six months? If I put on 80%, 90%, that's still more than most people uh, who have my circumstances, who are not uh, training and eating uh, mindfully and with good intent. So that's good mm. enough. Yeah, I love that. I mean, focus on the needle movers and consistently do that and be happy with 80%. I mean, even Pareto principle, uh, which is uh, universal across many different areas of your life, that 20% of the effort and time provides 80% of the results. So why struggle with, a, you know, to achieve the 100%, you know, that will require an additional 80% effort from you. But is that really worth it if it also detracts from living a good life? Uh, like you said, with, you know, family and social bonds and uh, having fun and enjoyment. I, I spent way too many years being too serious. I forgot what fun actually was because everything was just obsessing about optimizing everything. And 
you know, now I feel like I'm, I'm in a better place. I have my, uh, I have my periods uh, where I tend to forget that. And we all do. We all do. I do too. Yeah. Sure. Suffer from it, obviously. So, uh, um, so my soul tends to slap me in the face when I, when I do that. So I can snap out of it. Um, yeah. Fortunately. I think for the people listening, like, you need to understand what type of optimizer you are. If you're the one who's always has anxiety around it and is always making changes to your plan over and over again, and you're not seeing the best results, then you may be better off just like chilling out, doing the 80%. If you're mm -hmm. the person who's really achieving and you're the hundred percent and you have a YouTube channel, then keep doing it. That's great. But if you're finding that you're, you know, you have that curse or you feel trapped by it, then maybe reassess, like, do you need to apply every piece of information you're getting from every video you watch immediately? Is that actually a good idea? Or should you just look at your plan and say, hey, I'm progressing on 85% of my lifts week to week, month hmm. to month. Maybe that's good instead of tinkering for the sake of tinkering. Yeah, I completely agree. And uh, my coaching program is called uh, Peaceful Peak Performance. So it's not just about the performance or achieving a peak performance, but it's also having inner peace, you know, avoiding the overwhelm and uh, burnout that comes along with trying to be perfect in every area of your life. Because there's simply not enough time or uh, energy capacity uh, in any of us to to do that so we have to be essentialists and minimalists and do fewer things better for sure so now what i'm doing is i'm gonna throw out a couple of things and tell me if you think it's overrated underrated or fairly rated uh the first is meal timing the body prefers consistency uh regularity there's hormonal ebbs and flows and hunger hormones and everything that's tuned to when you normally eat. And sleep is also uh, very dependent on like the highest sleep qualities when you try to be consistent. So that's the foundation, I think. But it's not like something disastrous is going to happen if you miss a meal. And fortunately, I think that Jorn Trommelin and his group recently published a study showing that 100 gram protein feeding just takes a lot longer to digest and trickles amino acids and uh, prevents catabolism and uh, you know provides anabolism for up to 12 hours. And uh, people used to be obsessed about based off of whey protein studies using 20 grams uh, where you needed to have four protein feedings so that was superior to one 80 gram feeding simply because it was a whey protein which is an incredibly fast protein and not part of a solid meal balanced meal so when you just boil it down to having regular meals i think the timing or frequency matters less and there's plenty of real world examples of guys that have built impressive physiques with two and three meals and intermittent intermittent fasting so it's um i think try to look at your lifestyle and what's more uh feasible to do and sustainable mm -hmm. and go from that because it's at the end of the day what you can do consistently and enjoy doing that's going to provide the best long-term results, not something that always interferes with your schedule or gets in the way. Life gets in the way of optimal all the time. So you have to be adaptable and flexible more so than rigid and stuck in everything having to be perfect like we just talked about. Yeah, I find that challenging um, when, when dieting or cutting is like when I'm thinking about getting in enough protein enough times in the day i'm actually less likely to adhere to my uh, calorie target for example because mm -hmm. it, it changes how my ideal diet structure would look like to be satiated um so then i find like at times where i'm like 
I'm over, I'm overthinking this. So even myself, yeah. like with the nutrition side of things, I can overthink things like, okay, am I getting in enough protein? Um, and am I getting it enough times in the day? And then I look and it's like, oh, well, I missed my calorie target. And that was actually the important thing to hit because I'm focusing on this other shiny object over mm -hmm. here that yeah. I actually missed uh, the North Star there. So I, I find mm -hmm. that challenging even for myself on the nutrition side. Yeah, it's the same way with basically anything, training, business, uh, relationships. If you focus on the wrong thing and you exclude everything else, um, then you know, you're missing the big picture and probably missing a very essential uh, needle mover uh, that's way more important. Like, you know, I said earlier that people optimize their training and then they're sleeping four hours per night or eating poorly, you know, eating processed junk food and snacking on protein bars all the time. So it's, uh, you have to try to hit a sweet spot within all of these areas. And my advice is as soon as possible, get a routine that works and put it on automatic so you don't have to think about it. I mean, it's, there's a reason why, was it Steve Jobs or Bill Gates or, you know, maybe both of them that just used the same outfit every day. So they took the cognitive load off of having to plan what they should wear every day. So they could use that energy for the other big decisions that they had to make. And, and that, again, goes back to what I talked about earlier, that we have a limited capacity for energy and focus, and we have to be very careful with where we spend that. And the same goes for your adaptive energy, your ability to recover and, and um, achieve any sort of gain or result from anything. If you waste it in all sorts of direction, there's nothing left for perhaps what's the most important to you because you're just trying to be great in, in everything. And that's, you know, you can be a jack of all trades and master of none, you know, like the saying goes. And, and that's something I tend to see in all the high achievers that I work with. I uh, I have three of these polos and I've worn them for every uh, interview I've done. Yeah, it, it takes off the cognitive load about what I have to wear. It's like I just wear the black polo, done. Don't have to yeah. think about it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look at Alex Holmes. Yeah, I think he found like the perfect pair of shoes and he's just wearing that to the gym and to business meetings and to dinners yeah. and at restaurants. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Yeah, I think for him, the, the, a lot of it is uh, it's branding too. It's like a marketing and branding for sure. thing. Yeah. Like, Wearing uh, a wife beater and a cap and yeah, like, like a hobo and whatever. Yeah, yeah. I want. He's one of those guys. I wonder if that's uh, that's who he is, or that's who he's. That's the character he's playing. But that's fine. Yeah. Uh, all right, I got like one. Like the Liver King, maybe. <laughs> yeah, I got one more here. Uh, overrated, underrated, body fat set point. I don't think we have a clear answer to that. I think it's more habitual than, well, there's a genetic component for sure, but, you know, is it nature or nurture? That's, you know, they keep arguing about it. So I, I've seen previously obese people that, you know, all through their childhood, and that's where the number of fat cells are kind of decided. Uh, and they had obese parents as well. But in their adult years, they manage really well to adopt habits, eating habits and lifestyle habits that, you know, perhaps it takes slightly more effort than the next guy, but they're, you know, staying lean and healthy. And it's, it's just a natural part of their overall lifestyle. So I, I think it's easy to just blame genes or, you know, life or the universe isn't fair or I picked the wrong parents or whatever, but um, directed conscious effort put on automatic to be consistent is the key to success in mostly any, any endeavor in life. For sure. All right. So now I'm going to throw out a couple of quotes you've said. Just tell me your first thoughts on it. Uh, the first one is stagnation in the gym has three causes. Lack of stimulus, excessive fatigue, or lack of adaption? Yeah, 
those are the primary ways to grow muscle. You have to apply a, a stimulus. You have to manage fatigue because, and that's why you use auto regulation because it's like this instant feedback on um, how much of that fatigue you're you're actually uh, creating, and thus making it harder or easier for the future version of yourself to recover from that. So the recovery part will depend on, you know, your sleep, stress management, nutrition, just having all your ducks line up in a row. And then you have the individual differences in, in genes and hormones. Uh, that all of these pieces together determines how soon can you train that muscle again. And that's why it's going to be individual. You can't find the answer in the study or by following some influencer. You know, what's old is new again. So now it's this full body, high frequency craze again, or hype. And I was part of that probably 10 or 15 years ago. And I started my training career with high frequency training, you know, like you said, uh, the HST or um, hypertrophy specific training is a full body routine three times per week, or that's at least one application of the principles. And now it's been 25 years and yeah. it's back <laughs> like it's something new you know new shiny object and it's just you know been there since the 40s and 50s well steve reeves used to train full body routines so awesome so you're talking about you know fatigue and auto regulation you said that a deload is damage control that allows the fatigue to dissipate and thus allows you to display the performance or fitness that's already there it doesn't in and itself add anything in the same way fatigue doesn't add anything. It's a byproduct of not a cause of the stimulus. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, you need some level of fatigue to achieve a stimulus, but you shouldn't be chasing the fatigue. Uh, just accept it as a byproduct and managing it is important, I think, but it's not about avoiding it or chasing it. Some are now insisting that you should avoid it completely. You should always train this or that way because fatigue is, you know, such a huge problem. And uh, fatigue, I believe, perhaps is not part of the stimulus, but it, it's a sign that you have stimulated muscle growth. And it's just completely overreacting to something that's quite natural. It's like... You can't avoid all stressors in your life because stress also generates resilience. It's it's part of the general adaptation syndrome, which might not be universally true, but it's true in many different physiological pathways. Um, I tend to refer to getting a suntan as a good analogy for the training process. Like how much sun can you expose your skin to? will depend on your previous tanning experience, the intensity of the sunlight, where you are in the world, you know, the uh, UV index of, you know, is it cloudy? Um, and your individual tolerance to sunlight and how soon you recover from, you know, the intensity of that sunlight and the minor skin damage that, that has occurred. So there, there's no recipe for getting a suntan you have to look at your own individual suntan and how much sunlight and for how long you can expose your skin to and it, it just perfectly aligns with how the training process should be approached as well you can't google and figure out how much sun exposure uh, you you should have at you know is it january or is it june is it norway or is, or is it the Mediterranean, you know, all of these things are variables that needs to be accounted for. And and that's the same thing with stimulus fatigue recovery. For sure. I'm actually on the, uh, the worst genetic side for UV. I have a UV allergy. So hmm. if I'm exposed oh. to the sun, even for a few minutes, I get rashes and things like that. So it's actually interesting, right? There's that individual variability. So I have to try to avoid the sun as much as possible, even though that's mm -hmm. horrible, um, is what it is. <laughs> yeah. And also, again, comparing it to 
the muscle building process. Perhaps there's some weak links in the chain for you. Like you said, it could be something genetic. Could it be a nutritional thing? Could it be a lifestyle thing? Mm -hmm. There are many things that perhaps are the bottlenecks in achieving a suntan for you. So even with a slow, slow progression, you, you would always have that limitation until you address it. Or perhaps you're unable to due to you know genes or whatever is is going on there. But again, same thing with training. For sure. All right, got one more here. Where is that here? Do I want to appeal to a broader audience if it means straying from who I am and aspire to be? I used to listen to a lot of marketers that to achieve success, you need to have a wide, uh, what's, what's the name for it? You, you need to reach as many as possible because if you can convert one or 2% of that, that's going to be a huge number. And I tried that tactic, but it felt like I was losing myself because I have some core values and interests and, like you said in the you know introduction before you started recording for yourself, you need to align and uh, overlap what's important to you in life. And um, use the strategy that, like the Japanese proverb, the ikigai. You know what you're I good know at. That well. gonna, yeah, 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 yeah. And 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 I I, I just find myself constantly coming back to that ikigai where it needs to be an overlap so when i can talk about things that light me up that are inspiring to me and motivating to me then that will convert a higher percentage of a smaller audience and those are more loyal those are the ones that are true fans so I like the 1,000 true fans principle more than um, building some sort of brand that's just appealing to everyone because I think no one can be liked by everyone anyway. And you have to become comfortable with people disliking you and perhaps being controversial because those are your opinions and your values and it aligns with who you are and who you want to be and aspire to be. And that's going to be a much smoother journey through life, which feels more purposeful and meaningful to you. And you have an endless supply of motivation and inspiration from that obsession where your interests and, and values align. Instead of just trying to be everyone's cup of tea, I don't believe that's even possible and it tends to lead to cognitive dissonance and ambivalence and inco incongruence where you say something in one context and then suddenly you have to adapt to the audience you're speaking to or the person you're speaking to and you contradict yourself and i think eventually people are going to pick up on that and confront you with it and it's not going to feel true to your yourself, your core values, and, and create inner uh, dissonance, which creates unrest and anxiety, I think. Uh, in my experience, that has been the case. Yeah, I think uh, like something I would say is like incentive drives behavior. So if you're, it's in, if you need to be really careful as to what your uh, goals and incentives are, right? So if your goal is to be icky guy, which is care about your passion, mission, profession, I can't remember the other one, and then finding that sweet spot, you're going to do things towards that. But if your goal is to get as many followers or subscribers as possible, your behavior is going to act in that way. So when I started this podcast, my kind of North Star was to have like meaningful conversations with uh, people that I think are interesting and that I can learn from and to show them the respect that I've done the research. Like that is kind of my North star. So then I'm trying to make my interviews do that. But if my goal was to get as many subscribers as possible, I would just do five shorts a day. I would talk about more controversial topics. 
I'd probably lean more on the business and selling my company to Google side of things over and over again, because I know that's what would get me more subscribers and followers. So I think you need to be really careful about what your true goals in North Star are. If that's what you want, if your goal is to have as many followers as possible, that's fine. But be aware that that is what your goal is. And don't just kind of get swooped into that because that's what everyone else is doing. And I think that can be a challenge where it's like, my peer has 400,000 followers and they're posting every day. So I should be doing that as well. It's like, yeah, but what's driving them? What's driving you? You should be aware of that. Yeah, exactly. I, I love that. Um, it's, it's such, um, we live in a society where success is measured by engagement and likes. And that's just creating a lot of anxiety and overwhelm, I think, and, and always trying to, you know, optimize for the best strategy and, and tactics all the time. And, uh, um, I see so many of these optimizers just come and go because they burn out and I've been doing this for 30 years now and I always try to be true to myself and the few, well, there are quite many, <laughs> many periods where I, you know, suffered from burnout and overwhelm and depression and, you know, imposter syndrome. And these were always the periods of time where I tried to uh, follow the best strategies for getting this or that engagement, you know, watching YouTube videos and reading books and trying out things. And I just over and over again, keep coming back to the same conclusion. I need, I need to keep doing what's true to me and my mission and vision in, in life. Because that's going to feel like a good life. And I want to create sort of this future identity for myself and start to act like I'm a better version of myself. And uh, I even went through this exercise where I, um, I wrote my own funeral speech. And that was a very um, insightful and emotional experience wow because who who do i want to be what do i want people to remember me by and say when they are talking about me after i'm dead and i just clarified who i really want to be for others in a much deeper way than figuring out what's the optimal and best. I mean, there's been written books about what the top companies and top influencers and top um, voices in whatever industry has been doing. And those books, after 10 years, these companies and voices and influencers are gone. So that success didn't last long, did it? So what's true for those that have been been here for decades and i think it's always being true to this one core mission and, and vision and always checking in with yourself are you aligned with that or not and what are you saying yes to that you uh have to say no to other things and vice versa you know by saying no to this what can you say yes to those are important questions to ask yourself on a daily basis so, so similar to the funeral speech, um, when I need to make a really big decision, and I got this from like Jeff Bezos, is I project myself into the future, like I'm 80 years old, and I'm sitting on a rocking chair looking back on my life. Mm. And then it, and then I think like, do I want to do this? Am I going to regret doing this? Because sometimes we're so in the moment, it feels so like tactical. Like, for example, like when I quit Google, for example, like people are like, why are you quitting Google? You're stupid. Mm -hmm. And um, I just looked back when I was 80 and I was like, if I stick around there, I'm going to regret it because that's not what I want to do. Even though I know it's a great situation, like I need to just trust that instinct and I can always go mm -hmm. get a job at Facebook if I need to or whatever. Right? Like, that's fine. Um, so it's like projecting yourself in the future and looking back. And I imagine that... Uh, the exercise of uh, writing that speech is similar because you're um, trying to find the right adjectives to describe yourself, but then you want it 
you want those adjectives maybe to be uh, an improvement of, of your current self, hmm. right? And then you want to act in that way. That's true. Cool. All right. Hmm. I'm going to move uh, back to training here. Um, so we live in a time where we're either being told to always do full ROM or to do lengthened partials. Can you talk about how lifters should think about range of motion, especially based on their body types as they might be, you know, lanky like myself or some people might be stubby? Well, I mean, you, you could argue that the most contracted part of the range of motion, it seems to be less productive in, in research and employing a full range of motion is best for your mobility and, uh, there are, you know, there are some good studies showing that the lengthened part of the range of motion is is the most productive for sure. Uh, but I think it's another overreaction that you know people are then again becoming so obsessed about what's essentially just minor differences in muscle growth. I mean, it's, we're, we're talking zero point one millimeters uh, over uh, ten to twelve week studies, barely significant enough to to actually be able to measure with the finest instruments so it's it's um it's again comes back to what what's sustainable for you and i've seen that when, once you start limiting rom or overemphasizing certain parts of it it tends to lead to discomfort or um i i, I think over time you have to the same way to age gracefully you, you need to have the right um the right combination of strength flexibility and coordination so overly emphasizing one part of whatever training variable is same thing with lower reps versus high reps or and even excluding the middle we need some um element of all of these variables to to have complete development over time you can even argue for the most contracted part of the range of motion where you squeeze a muscle, it leads to higher pro proprioception and ability to recruit that muscle. So perhaps not instantly, but over time, that's going to lead to, to better results and better outcomes. So, so that's my, my general advice. 80% of the time, full range of motion, and then play around with the more extreme ends of the range of motion. Do you think there's a difference between someone who's got longer arms and is more lanky compared to someone who's more stubby from a range of motion or biomechanics standpoint? Well, yeah, for sure. I mean, if you have long arms and long legs, uh, some joints or ranges of motion is going to be like, like say, a deadlift for a short guy and a deadlift for a tall basketball player it's, it's going to take that joint through vastly different range, ranges of motion it's going to be a longer bar path you're, you're going to be performing way more work uh, even with the lighter loads and the leverages are different so sometimes you have to figure out what's a safe range of motion for you and and um I mean, like for me, bench press always tended to just injure my shoulders because I have long arms and a yeah. relatively flat chest. So I have to either use a just really extreme powerlifting arch or just limit the range of motion so that I'm not constantly bombarding the connective tissue instead of the muscle because that's some part of the range of motion, you're going to be straining the connective tissue more than the muscle, mm. uh, simply because you're reaching uh, a limitation there. So it's it's important to be aware of these things as well. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw up some pictures on the screen, uh, you and some people. Tell me either something you learned from this person or if you have a good story with them. Uh, the okay. first is uh, you and Menno. Yeah. Menno has been a longtime friend of mine. Um, I read some of his articles on Tea Nation and started sending him some emails. And we, we eventually started working together. He was my coach for a bodybuilding competition. Wow. Um, and we started collaborating, doing seminars together. Uh, now we're collaborating on an app called Cybernetic Fitness. 
Awesome. It's been ongoing for 11 years now. It's uh, <laughs> probably way too advanced and complex. So we went through two different developer teams and eventually ended up with two guys, previous Google employees, uh, you know, uh, synchronicities and all that stuff. And they're, uh, they're um, part owners of the business as well. Smart. Yeah, so it's an ongoing process, and Menno's done really well for himself and created this PT course and his coaching business. And is, is you know, he's way ahead of me, uh, even though I started my training career uh, before his time. But he's uh, one of the smartest guys I know, and just uh, a generally likable yet sometimes stubborn uh, man, and that is exactly what I am too. So I guess that's <laughs> why we, we get along so well. Awesome. All right. Next one is you and Abel. Mm, yeah. Um, Abel, I was coaching for a while and we just hit it off really well. Uh, he's also a very smart guy, way smarter than he thinks of himself. 100%. And, uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. And he's done really well with his uh, YouTube channel. He's creating great content. I mean, I'm, I'm really impressed by some of his presentations and concepts and, and the way he just presents and communicates, uh, you know, getting lean and building muscle and with some great guests. So, um, I, you know, I visited him, as you can see here. Um, we had uh, a program called Sustainable Self-Development, which was based on the HST principles. Uh, did really well with that. Uh, went our separate ways, but, you know, we touch bases now and then and send each other messages and, you know, how's life and can you help me with this uh, uh, situation here and what do you think and that kind of stuff. So very, very likable guy. Yeah, absolutely. I find myself watching a lot of his old videos because I find that content is sometimes better than some of the new content that comes out because it's very uh, nuanced and very kind of deep on the, the mental side of things as well. I find it very hmm. relatable. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, all right, next one here is you with uh, with a whole slew of people. Maybe mm -hmm. tell me either one of them or tell me about where this was. <laughs> yeah. Where was this again? I'm not really sure, but I mean, I I did um, presentations at uh, the same venues as these guys probably three times now, three or four times. And, uh, you know, I talked to them. We went downtown and had drinks together and dinners. And uh, we were in Amsterdam together. Maybe this is in Amsterdam, come to think of it. And... Um, I was there with my girlfriend, so we came home early and I saw them at breakfast the next day and they were really, really hungover. <laughs> <laughs> I think they, they just returned back to the hotel like two hours earlier or something. And um, yeah, I, I, I generally like all of these guys, even though some of them have also done things that they aren't so proud of and said things that they probably regret afterwards. Uh, I think it just comes with the territory. Uh, trying to have a name for yourself in this business sometimes requires you to be contrarian and have strong opinions. I'm, I'm a fan of the, um, the motto, strong convictions held loosely. And that's probably why I've kind of have, you know, perhaps been more stable <laughs> in this industry and I'm still here. Yeah. Uh, but but I haven't created uh, such a big following or name for myself as these guys have. So, you know, it's uh, you win some, you lose some, I guess. All right, I'll finish today off with something fun. What did you learn or tell me why you like The Matrix? I think I watched The Matrix 70 or 80 times <laughs> it, it just something about it's it's the hero's journey part it's the story behind neo being sort of this anonymous uh nobody that just 
comes to terms with eventually that he's the one he's going to be the savior of the human race and the struggle and burden of being that uh, just hit the spot for me it struck a nerve it, it resonated deeply with my overarching uh, mission and spiritual um path i think that's um i've, I've um, become quite spiritual in the last half of my life and done a lot of in introspection and meditations and different courses and, and uh, retreats and it just this common theme keeps returning that i'm here to help people transform transmute their energy to a higher frequency and i do honestly believe i have some gifts in that regard because i'm able to see things and understand things people keep telling me wow they've been in therapy for 10 years or they've you know been reading books or uh, done a lot of soul searching but something i said just completely switched their whole perspective on a very important piece of their own puzzle so um I, i've taken that to heart and respected that and um try to make it not so much about myself but my mission of helping others uh find a path through the darkness and the struggle and the overwhelm and i believe my life's journey has been the way it has been exactly because i needed to learn the lessons so that i could help others get through uh, that inner turmoil turmoil and anxiety themselves so yeah it's I'll gladly watch uh, the Matrix many times over, and uh, it's it's uh, it was kind of a life changing experience to me. Not just for the special effects, but just because that story really struck something deep inside me. That's beautiful. I rewatched it maybe two three months ago, and. I was like, this movie's still amazing. Like, there, it yeah. has such good replay value. Uh, I, I probably am not thinking about it as deeply as you are. I think I was just there, kind of enjoying it and enjoying Neo being the one, and you know, the story. It's it's just really well done. Yeah, I was kind of disappointed in the sequels, but you know, some of it was cool. But it, I I haven't even I, watched, I, I haven't watched the most recent one. I just can't get myself to do it. I think it's like Matrix Four or whatever it yeah. is. I haven't you, seen that one. So. You're not missing out. I think they kind of maybe let the success go to their heads or something. And um, I, I don't know. The the first movie stands on its own. You didn't even need the sequels. No, they got a little weird with it after because then it was like, oh, you're not the only one. There's always these ones. Mm. It's a glitch in the Matrix. I liked it. I, the first movie was amazing. Just they should yeah. have just stuck with that. But yeah, I agree completely. Anyways, uh, thank you so much for your time today. Where can everyone find you? I've been posting consistently on Instagram for a while, but uh, it kind of ended up being a very noisy place and uh, many big egos and uh, weak egos. I think that just can't tolerate that you disagree and. Um, since I'm more of a believer in elevating our common understanding and knowledge so that we can help everyone to the best of our abilities, uh, it's maybe not the best platform to me. Uh, for me, um, I'm, I've started to write more on LinkedIn because I, you know, my main uh, client, uh, my main cl clientele is high performers, high achievers, CEOs, leaders um that just you know want to have a better life quality so it, it feels more like home to me and so yeah instagram once in a while i try to post on nuggets of gold uh, when i can and have some deep insights there's more quality than quantity or consistency 
LinkedIn, I'm just finding my footing and writing more consistently. So other than that, my homepage, borgerfamily.com, and also get my ebook at myreps.com. It's my my legacy when it comes to training physiology and the whole process of uh, achieving peak performance. Awesome. Thanks so much for your time. Appreciate it. It's an honor. Thank you.